Our next guest is considered one of the most important and sought after painters of his generation, and his portraits are featured in museums around the globe. That's right. He's not only an art world darling, but celebrities like Denzel Washington and Elton John have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for his work. Mm -hmm. Kahinde Wiley, welcome to Arise Entertainment 360. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. My goodness. Oh, I feel like I'm in a museum. It's beautiful work. <laughs> Beautiful Great. work. Thank so you. let's talk about your meteoric rise. My you meteoric graduated rise. from Yale with an MFA in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. and in less than, than, than a decade, you've become one of the most important painters of your generation. What do you attribute your stunning success to? Well, there's, there's a level of success, certainly, that uh, matters. And mm -hmm. I think most of what matters to me is making contact with young black and brown kids out there who are seeing the work in museums. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid growing up and studying art, it was rare that you'd see uh, paintings like this in the great museums in the world. And I think that's what makes me the most proud, to be mm -hmm. able to see that and to, to go into the American street, and incre increasingly the global street, mm -hmm. and to, to transfer that moment into, to, into the walls of great museums in the world. Wow. Well, and it's great that they'll see themselves depicted in the paintings, too, because so many times when they do go to museums, they don't see the reflection of their skin tones in the pictures. It's tough. I remember growing up, learning how to paint, looking at... Uh, a Rubens painting, for right. example. There's a great tradition of learning how to paint, studying the old masters. How do you get those colors? How do you mix blues and reds and greens to arrive at uh, resplendent black skin? Mm -hmm. That's something that I learned uh, at the San Francisco Art Institute as a young student, and later at Yale, uh, slowly fashioning a vocabulary of how to create black beauty in black painting. Black beauty. Mm. Now, the New York Times explained your appeal as such, quote, his paintings are big and bold, and the colors are exquisitely rich. Their iconography is hip, savvy, and spiked with references to mm. the European high art tradition. Well, that's a rave. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. What do you make of that assessment of your work? Well, it's always good to have a love letter, especially coming mm -hmm. from the New York Times, yes. but I think my biggest critic happens to be the people who spend time with those paintings on the day-to-day, -day, the people who live with the works, the collectors, and certainly the public who go to see the work in museums. What I try to do is to get outside of the ivory tower, those grand mm. institutions, and go actually to cities where the population groups are perhaps underserved people who can't afford to go to the great museums of the world, and perhaps people who you would pass by the streets on the day to day and maybe not pay attention to. Mm. It's those people who you'll see now at the Brooklyn Museum, mm -hmm. which actually will be having a show in 2015 at the Brooklyn Museum. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Okay. And, well, uh, you know, piggybacking on that, Kahinde, you paint men of color primarily, and they're often depicted as these larger than life, mm -hmm. colossal figures. Is that because for many of these men, they're often ignored, vilified, and demonized by society at large? I think so. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I live in this skin. I live in this black American male skin. And I know that, by and large, black men in the United States have been um, sort of coded as being associated with uh, hypersexuality, a uh, propensity towards sports and antisocial behavior. Mm -hmm. What does that have to do with the life that I live? What does that have to do with the bright young individuals that I've met in, in my mm -hmm. lifetime? So my work has devoted itself to being able to tell the fullness of who we are and, and what we are. Mm -hmm. And I know your original work was also originally inspired by old masters like Teopolo, Titan, Velasquez, Raphael. But what was it about those artists that really spoke to you? Well, the vocabulary of painting is a vocabulary of power. Wow. Who has it? Who has the right to it? All of those grand narrative portraits that you see are showing people who feel completely self-possessed. And that's what I'm looking for when I walk the streets. Mm -hmm. That's what I look for when I see someone who's minding their own business, trying to get to the subway, right. and I say, stop for a moment. Do you mind posing for one of these pictures? Mm -hmm. Most people say no. <laughs> uh, I think what you'll find is that, you know, in New York City and most major cities throughout the world, people have this guard, this armor. Absolutely. Who is this person? What mm -hmm. do you want? And the idea that the reveal, in fact, is a grand narrative portrait and that it's something that honors an individual is something that's quite a surprise to many. You don't want anything from them. You're giving something yes. to them, actually, and it, it is a great gift. Mm. I think I'm giving to them, but I think I'm also participating in a conversation that has a lot mm. to do with the broader evolution of of culture. And you've been given to the world while you're traveling around the globe sharing your beautiful paintings from Lagos to New Delhi and this is a new thing for you doing with your world stage series. Now how did you go about selecting all the countries that you would be visiting 
part, as part of your series. We have here Brazil, Nigeria, India, China, Israel, just to name a few. And it was important for you to also focus outside of the U.S., right? Right. This whole project started as a way of sort of looking at black American culture. As I got bigger and bigger and was invited to work all over the world, I started to recognize that black American culture has been beamed out to the rest of the world. It's one and of our leading exports here. That's correct. It's true. <laughs> That's right. You can go to the streets of New Delhi and the streets of, of uh, Rio and find that people are ex expressing themselves through the lens of black American creative culture. And so that's something that I try to get down in a, in a really um, open way to sort of slow down and pay attention to, to the, the small nuances and to how people express themselves. Mm. I was recently in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem yes. realizing that there's a, a full range of cultural experiences there. Uh, my next show actually will be in London on October 14th during Freeze. And it charts the presence of black American culture but it also draws a, a level of, of connection between British culture in the 18th and 19th centuries, mm. portraiture, and the black Jamaican street. Wow. And are you inspired by those things and the cultures you see around the world? And can we see them and say, okay, that's when he visited such and such, and that's where he visited that? You, you certainly can. Mm. In fact, what I'm trying to do is make specific points about very specific parts of the world, but I'm mm -hmm. also trying to say that we all share certain things in common. Yes. You know? And um, in so far as art is effective, what it does is it says something very specific. My portrait of Lola would be certainly about Lola, but it would also say that something. That would also be my dream. <laughs> <laughs> you have my word on it. We'll okay. work on it. Yes. But to, answer, off, the, but to yes. answer that, it, it says that this is about an individual who occupies a space that's very local, very mm -hmm. specific. What does it say about Lola specifically, but also what does it say about the community and the nation uh, that gave rise to who you are and what you value? I think that's also interesting in the way you depict what they're wearing, what they're doing, the poses they make. You usually give them the option, wear whatever you want, pose how you want. That's different for an artist who's usually like, I want you to sit here, do this, and wear this clothing. That's true. In fact, artists are the auteurs. Authors mm. and artists have the power over what gets decided in those mm -hmm. paintings. And I've decided to say, actually, let's allow the young men and women in these paintings decide how they want to be positioned. Mm. Uh, my models will go through our history books. Exactly. What is the process? Walk us through that. Ah, so my process is once you're in the studio, you go through my collection of art history books and you look at the art that I've been spending years obsessing over. Mm -hmm. And what's in there? Why are people posed a certain way? What's up with the clothing and the body language? The way that an individual responds to that history reveals on some level aspects of how they want to be seen in a painting. So if they choose a more grandiose pose, what does that say about them? Or if they choose a more a, a, a meek pose, a more subtle pose, what is, what is their Well, let's make this an experiment. That? When okay. I make the painting of you, okay. for example. Okay, yes. What, what <laughs> She's <sort> ready. <laughs> what I'll sort be of... on a white horse with a staff in my head. And a crown on her a head. A crown on my head, a big sash. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but you're, we're joking, but we're getting at something that's, I think, dead serious, which is the language of power. Mm -hmm. And painting has so, so often been occupied uh, as a language of power for the church and for the state. And uh, what I've allowed to do, uh, what I've allowed to happen is that the models, in fact, go through that vocabulary, piece together their, their own sentences. What does this say about me? And how do I choose to self-empower within this field? Now, I've been on a casting with you. We were in downtown Brooklyn. We spent a rainy afternoon trying to find women for one of your exhibits. That's and right. that process was very interesting to me, just to watch you work. How did you go about choosing which women you would approach? And how did you go about convincing them to actually say yes? Good question. And as, as you remember, it was quite a rainy day. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't easy because I think so much of it had to do with the camera crew and mm -hmm. with that sense of, of, of performance that was going on in the streets. Many people in America respond differently than people do internationally. Really? You'll find that Americans who live in this sort of just add water celebrity post, post Paris hit mm -hmm. built in culture mm -hmm. will find uh, being approached in the streets to be, well, of course you found me. Right? <laughs> um, yes, everybody uh, thinks they're a star. That's uh, right, right, that's right. And to that degree, you have to sort of measure up. Do I cut, do I cut it as, mm -hmm. as uh, a potential uh, interaction for someone? 
I think those people who slowed down and looked at examples of my work and who got it and, and were curious enough to make that leap uh, became the subjects of those mm. paintings. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. That was your first exhibit that featured all women. It was called The Economy of Grace. Why did you shift from painting men to women and what was the difference? How, how did that influence the way you produced your work? Well, gender is a huge part of it. And I think that so much of my work has to do with isolating features of power. Mm -hmm. Women occupy a very powerful place in the narrative of history painting. And I wanted to sort of isolocate that and find out what features are, uh, we could investigate within that. And so to that end, I actually looked at fashion. I went uh, and did a collaboration with Ricardo Tisci, who's the director of one of the most powerful fashion houses uh, in the industry, Givenchy, and we created a system in which couture clothing and a conversation with and about the history of art was brought up. <clears throat> Ricardo and I actually walked through the Louvre and we found specific paintings that we then made a series of clothes of, uh, around. And each of those models that, that you and I found the, those days in the streets went to Givenchy and had couture gowns made. That's what you see them wearing wow. in those paintings. Did they understand that you were offering them an opportunity to not only wear couture clothing, but to be immortalized? Well, I think that immortalization is something that's certainly part of how you look at a painting. Mm -hmm. I mean, these things last a lot longer than mm -hmm. we do. Absolutely. Um, but there's also something radically modern about them. You know, to, to be able to see a painting in a museum where someone's rocking saggy jeans one year, but then fast forward, there's all these new brands and labels and means of expressing yourself in the urban street. It's very much about a long sense of time, but it's also of the moment right mm. now. What does it look like in the streets of New Delhi, New York, Beijing? That's the strength of the work. Wow. Well, tell us a little bit about your background and growing up, because I know your father is Nigerian, your mother's African-American, but you were born and raised in Los Angeles, and you're actually a twin, hence your That's name, right. Kahinde. That's now, what right. does that name mean, number one? And number two, were you aware at all when you were growing up the importance of twins in the Yoruba culture? Ah, good. Uh, <laughs> African studies class. That, okay. <laughs> very impressed. In fact, uh, if you ah. meet a Kehinde, you'll have to uh, always ask about their twin because Kehinde mm. means second born of twins. Mm. My father is Nigerian. Uh, my mother's from Texas, so I guess mm. that makes me a proud African American. In the mm. truest sense of the phrase. Right. I uh, grew up in South Central Los Angeles um, with my mother. My father returned to uh, Nigeria after his studies when uh, their relationship uh, came to an end. And I later went to Africa in my 20s to find my father. And so I've always had this sort of interesting relationship with Africa. I'm in and of uh, South Central Los Angeles, the black American street, but always having this sort of long view towards the cultural uh, and ethnic relationship between African America and black Africa. And cool. South Central LA, it was rough yeah. back in the 80s, Kehinde. Talk to us about growing up there, because it's wildly different from the places that you traffic in now and you, and you live now. That's true, mm -hmm. that's true. Growing up in South Central Los Angeles in the 80s allowed for me to have a sense in which there is great light and great joy in those neighborhoods. It also, um, I think, informed the empathy that I have towards the people who populate the paintings mm -hmm. that I create. But it was also uh, an environment that my mother wanted to pull me away from in order to supply me with opportunity for, for chance and for growth. She put me in art school to keep me out of the streets. And mm. me and my twin brother went to art school every weekend. And it was because of that looking, because of that studying painting every weekend, that I slowly discovered this passion for picture making. Wow, you speak of your mother, but also your father. You didn't really grow up with him, and I know you went in your 20s to Nigeria to find him, to meet him, to learn more about him. Why was it important for you to take that journey, and how did it, you go about tracking him down in the first place? Well, it's tough. I mean, uh, my mother and father had a uh, brief relationship while they're both mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. and going back when I was 20 years old sort of plugged me into that age in which they they first engaged. And I remember going to Nigeria not knowing where he was, knowing mm. his first and last name and what he studied in university, and having that as a starting point. That's it? To one of the most populated wow. nations in Africa. Then where names are common. Yes, yeah. 140 something million people, and you That's, found him? And I found him. That's wow. not a needle in a haystack. That's far <laughs> more than that. How did you pull that off, Detective Kahinde? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I did was I went to universities. I uh -huh. knew that he studied architecture and 
college. Okay. And so I would actually go to uh, university architecture departments. And sure enough, using his last name as the starting point, went to the ethnographic capital of that region, went to that school, and his name is on the door. He was the head of the department at that point. Wow. What was your initial meeting like? I'm sure it was emotional. Shocking well, for him. That's right. His that's son right. shows up. Hello, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> it was a game changer, and I uh -huh. rarely talk about this. And so one, one of the things that I, I found in it was that there was a very different Africa than the one that I had mm -hmm. seen on television growing up. And it began, I think, what I, what I really am fascinated with now, which is shattering this notion between images and realities. Mm -hmm. Who is this man that you've been thinking about in your entire life, this father who you've never seen? Right. What is this nation that you had only seen in pictures reproduced, oftentimes in negative ways? Those levels of complexity and those levels of emotional clarity, I mean, staring at someone who, whose genes you share mm -hmm. was quite profound and continues to be. Mm. Goodness. Wow. And you've since gone on to do amazing things. We've spoken about the exhibits. What's your current project? And tell us all about it. And we have to talk about fashion, because clearly your suit is right. not playing uh, around. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, if anything, I could say I'm a maximalist. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely love being able to play with color and design. And, and to that extent, I always try to dress in that same sense of celebration that my paintings bring about. Um, my next project, actually, um, to go back to this conversation between uh, London and Kingston, will be in London and all of the subjects coming from the streets of Jamaica. Fantastic. Wow. And speaking of celebration, we'll be celebrating that, but also Lola tells me you throw a killer party. <laughs> so we gotta know when's your next party? And I know it's gonna be maximized times ten. <laughs> My next ten. party will be oh uh, Jesus. You know what? I'll tell you, Lola, and I'm sure she'll whisper it out. Oh okay. all right. A secret. <laughs> I love it. Really quickly, and I know you can't go in depth about it, sure. but the leaders of African countries, there's a a project that's in its nascent stages. Can you mention a little bit about that? I can. I mm -hmm. can. In fact, I'm glad you bring this up. Mm -hmm. So much of what um, we're looking at, and of course Obama being in Senegal today, um, represents the real, the real strong importance of African leadership and, and the presence of a black president going to uh, nations like Senegal um, uh, represents the sort of deficit of, of perceived leadership. Mm -hmm. And so what I've done is I've actually decided to go throughout Black Africa and, and look at leadership and to sit down and have audiences with leaders and uh, discuss the history of portrait making. And uh, I can't tell you too much, oh. but more to come. Okay, well when it does come, you'll be first here, right? <laughs> you got my word on that. Okay, good, good, good. Kahinde Wally, thank you so much for being here. Can't wait to see you again soon. Thank you very much. And you're watching Arise Entertainment 360.